thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, I will try to continue from the remark by uh, Peter uh, at the end of the last session about this bifurcation, the concept of poesis, uh, as something that is production out of nothing and also something that has this kind of transitional, or I would maybe say transformative aspect. I'm coming from theater uh, and I'm practically there, very practically there. And uh, I will try to speak from that position today. Uh, uh, and as you know, and that, as it was mentioned today, in the history of theater, uh, the poetics were kind of, through the centuries, predominant mode of discourse produced on the artistic work, artistic practice, and uh, specifically on the production of the way of making. Uh, and uh, one of those seminal works, uh, Plato, uh, uh, Aristoteles' uh, Poetics, was mentioned today. Uh, I would add to that another one, uh, and this is Plato's Symposium, which also uh, articulates uh, in the Otimus words there uh, the concept of poesis, uh, slightly different, but with the importance differentiation, the concept of poesis as something that is production into presence. So while with Aristoteles we are discussing more about the making, uh, with Plato we have, uh, there is more uh, emphasis on the production, or on, on something that is in English translation also translated as bringing forth. And uh, this kind of dialectic between uh, understanding uh, poesis as making and uh, poesis as production was following uh, many, many centuries, through uh, theater through many centuries, but suddenly in the after the 70s of the last century, it stopped. Somehow it stopped. There is a huge lack, we can say, even if we would be uh, uh, judging the current situation, of the discourse on poetics in the field of performing arts in general. And there is a very strong focus on two other uh, aspects of uh, artistic creation. One is focus on practice, artistic practice. So there is a huge production of the uh, um, theory of practice and different practicalities, I would say. And then on the other side, there is uh, something that I would call care for spectator, uh, uh, either coming from the politics of spectatorship or uh, uh, from another angle, uh, logics of specific modes of re-socialization or socialization of the spectators through the artistic work. So uh, the, uh, the text that I will read today or the kind of statement that I will try to bring out today is coming from, uh, on one side, the need to rethink that situation. And I would say that this situation uh, coincides with the changes in the economy of performing arts in general or the changing logic of institutional frame in performing arts in general, which is shifting from, as we know it historically, houses of production of theater and showing the production to curated houses, which are mostly focused on presentation and uh, circulation of the work. So uh, the, we, we are now uh, somehow confronting in performing arts and in theater in general uh, what was called curatorial turn sometimes ago in uh, visual arts, but uh, the logics of economic economy in one frame and in another are very different, and those who say, yeah, we know all about it, are somehow missing that point that theater is produced in uh, um, substantially different ways than uh, visual arts and that this also endangers or changes the whole logic of production of performing arts in general. So uh, I will use the topic uh, term, uh, uh, the concept of theater uh, in very wide terms. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I will not talk about the performance which is very common today. I will talk about the theater as an act of watching. So not only act of performing, but also an act of watching. And I try to understand the theater on one side as a uh, um, mode of production, and on the other side as a process of instituting uh, forms and relations uh, of life. So uh, in a way, I will try to go all around uh, uh, different ways of uh, uh, 
transforming the act of watching in uh, theatrical acts, public theatrical acts or represented theatrical acts uh, towards something that would be a claim on the current status of institutions uh, and uh, their relations to the uh, very concept of poesis. So, uh, the reflections on transformation of the theatrical dispositive have evo evolved uh, for centuries on the boundary between the viewer and the stage. By exploring the possibility of its breach, transfer, dislocation or position exchange. The basic premise of this logic has been the mirroring, reflective logic of theatre. Even Artaud's radical intervention is an inversion of that dual relation, since it posited, posited theatre as a generator and the world as its reflection. Thus understood, theatre is an art that shows itself to the viewer, and all attempts at changing this image of theatre have been an attempt at changing the viewer's function whereby the viewer has always been understood as someone external to theatre. However, the very manifestation of theatre has rarely been discussed, namely that theatre always and already includes the viewers and their viewing, even during the rehearsals when the viewing is merely supposed and theatre happens before the, before the unborn viewer. The event of theatre, unlike its show, has rather refractive than reflective character. And that refraction occurs precisely on the membrane that separates its two different local manifestations, whereby the style of existence of its participants changes as well. First, it is theater as the institutional relationship between the audience or public and the artists or producers. And second, theater as a poetic set or conjun conjuncture of viewers and actors in performance, living and non-living actors. However, I'm not referring to refraction as an effect of one idea passing through two different media or two ideologies. It is more adequate to think of it as a deflection in the style of existence of theater's agents, the viewers and the artists, resulting from an encounter on the membrane, membrane between the institution and poetics, and not only stage and auditorium. In this duality, theater realizes its power of refraction. It is now materially factual, and thus the world does not see itself only in theatre, but also through theatre, which makes theatre a polygon par excellence for reflecting on social objects, its parallel involvement in social processes, as well as the ways of separating from them. Theatre always resembles other social processes and differs from them at the same time. Nevertheless, it is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain this dual status owing to the transformations in the modes of production. Understanding theatre <clears throat> as a medium per se has always been an uncanny thought, primarily because theatre is a place in which the basic disturbances in communication, such as noise, retardation and redundancy, play a creative role or constitutive role. Today it may even be of importance to re-emphasize the difference between creation and communication. Thereby, I do not mean to say that there is no mediation or communication in theater. On the contrary, if theater is a place of potential encounters, then the process of theater is a performance of translation between the contacting problematics, coordinative systems, referential frameworks, context discursive universes, regimes of tensions, and modes of existence. Theater forever immersed in the media environment is a mediator in the sense in which Bruno Latour has differentiated between mediators and intermediary. Understanding theater as a mediator instead of a mere, mere intermediary implies that it is not a mechanism transferring the interpretation of an external author or authority. Its mode of, fu of functioning is interpretation, if interpretation is understood as translation as well as the agency interprets in the same time being an agent and tra translator. Um, such translation implies the creation of a specific composite, and historically we know a number of these composites. Uh, in Denis Diderot, Diderot's uh, theatre it was Tableau Vivant, in uh, uh, Brecht's Gestus, in Artaud's uh, Hieroglyph, in Beckett's Breath, and 
somehow st I started from the needy the road because that was the point when the image was introduced in theater, specifically into poetic writing. And from that moment on, uh, the viewing act of viewing in theater gets its important, uh, specifically in the way how the theater works and not only what theater represents. Um, so, uh, such translation implies the creation of a composite and its capacity exceeds above all the pure function of translating a clear manage, me message or meaning. In Roland Barthes' words, they are erecting a meaning but also manifesting the production of that meaning. Instituting theatre implies a constant process of articulation, differentiating according to that which is external to it. However, as theatre is never entirely enclosed in itself, it never acquires complete stability as a manifestation, and it never radically differentiated, tending instead towards delocalization. Paradoxically, in order to establish its own situations through which it becomes instituted, it necessarily becomes relocalization itself. Theatre exposes its images to viewing, Yet these images and reactions to them are inseparable from each other. Everything, in Deleuze's words, everything that is to say, every image is, is, is indistinguishable from its actions and reactions. And thus theatre is always part of some imminent appearing. Even though an image is delocalized by being exposed to viewing, severed from one network of relations and then entering another one, the articulation of the new set of relations objectifies and homogenizes it. What happens here is sedimentation in Laclau's terms. Having borrowed the term from Husserl, Laclau has used it to describe stable topographies, spaces created by means of routinized and hegemonic practices. Insofar, uh, 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 quote, insofar as an act of institution has been successful, a forgetting of origins tends to occur. The system of possible alternatives tends to vanish and the traces of the original contingency to fade. In this way, the instituted tends to assume the form of a mere objective presence. This is the moment of sedimentation. But let me bring into proximity now three different dispositives, three different institutional dispositives, and their processes of sedimentation through a record of one historical event, which will open possibly the gate to think about three dispositives and their are parallel histories. One is theater, another is cinema, also related to uh, the dispositive of theater, uh, and the third one would be the factory. So, uh, I will come back to that image, but let me show you uh, something that you are familiar with. Uh, just to mention, um, most of these insights are, are coming out as a kind of what Brecht would call plumpesdenken, out of the acquired from the practice of work in theatre. And uh, the examples I will show is uh, some are always related to artwork that we've done through the performances, staging, or reenacting some of these historical um, uh, situations. So. This is the very first film ever made, Workers Leaving Lumiere Factory in Lyon. The length of the first reel was 50 seconds, 800 images. And this film marks the beginning of moving pictures. This is the second take of the first film ever made, Workers Living Lumiere Factory in Lyon. Uh, it's obvious that Brothers Lumiere, who were the first cinema makers on one side of the gate, and uh, owners of the factory on the under, other, or industrialists on the other side of the gate, uh, made their workers to move more intensively in front of the camera because they realized that they have something in their hands, you know, the new discovery. Uh, this film doesn't have logical beginning nor logical ending, and the length of the reel is still the same, 50 seconds. And this is the first film I've ever directed, Workers Leaving Lumiere Factory in Lyon. Notice here that film starts with the gate opening and ends with the gate closing. This means that all the workers managed to leave factory in the length of the first reel, 
50 seconds. This film is in the same time the first film ever edited by the uh, extraction of unnecessary movement from uh, the action or let's say or let's call it choreographed which is one of the characteristic practices for contemporary theater too. There is no dog anymore, only, but the door closes before the dog comes in. So, uh, this very first film somehow is a point from which we can start about, start speculate about these relations that I mentioned. What this first film also introduces is also the frame. If you would go back to the image, you would see that the, there is a proper frame. The proper frame is the frame of the gate of the factory. Everybody manages to do an action in time, and this film is made in the time of uh, of uh, assembly lines production, so in, in the time of industrial production, where cutting out of unnecessary movement was a regular practice in organization of contemporary labor at that time. Number of the choreographies of these times worked or, uh, or was involved in the research of movement in the factories, and there is something choreographically unconscious uh, in this film, which also suggests uh, possible speculation on the further developments of these relations. If we go to the history, which I don't have time for sure to open now, but which is a part of the research that I'm attempting to do, uh, of the relation between uh, theater uh, and cinema, we will see that at the early stages, more or less, we have seen staged scenes uh, recorded by camera. Uh, if you go for, for example, Méliès, uh, uh, Trip to the Moon, you will see that this is basically theater studio or dispositive uh, uh, with camera being steady and then bodies and sets changing in front of the camera. But the interesting thing happens at the, at the moment when camera becomes active, when camera starts to move and bodies slow down. Bodies start to be more static and the gaze starts to follow another logic than we know it from uh, the theater. And this is probably the moment when theater and movie go separate ways, but the logic of uh, uh, cinematic production and cinematic viewing come back to theater all the time as a kind of new knowledge and new uh, way of thinking that is related to the very acts of performance. So, I'd like to illustrate the dynamics of production and instituting here through uh, these three uh, parallel dispositives, theater, cinema, and factory, through four manifestations of choreography in four different records of the camera, in which choreography and movement enter into equally different relationships with the production of relations, the practice of instituting, and the institutionalization of practice. So, the first one, are the two photographs of Marta Paulina Brina, a Slovenian dancer dancing for the Partisan Brigade in 1943. The second is a, mo uh, a film uh, or a film journal called Liberation of Zagreb, which is a film by Branko Marjanovic and group of cameramen shot in the last days of occupation and the first days of liberated Zagreb uh, in 1945. Then a movie, The Flag, a film made by the same author, Branko Marjanovic, in 1949. And Mystery of I.B.'s Castle, uh, a brief propaganda film by Milan Katic, one of the cinematographers from the action of Liberation of Zagreb. Besides wishing to juxtapose the, the dispositives of cinema, theater and factory, I'm using examples linked to the camera, be it photographic or cinematic because they record and document the act of viewing in theater in a very intriguing way, transforming it into a social object, but also allowing watching from a side, which I would find as a very important moment in uh, uh, understanding the logic of a theater dispositive. So first, Marta Paulina Brina. She was a Slovenian dancer trained by a student of Mary Wigman, a famous German choreographer. Before she joined the partisan movement in 1943, she had several significant choreographic acts which have been described as the new trend in Slovenian dance. The photograph of Joze Petek shows Brina dancing in her partisan uniform in front of the thrilled members of a partisan brigade 
mostly former Jewish inmates of an Italian concentration camp on the island of Arab, dissolved in 1943. So this brigade, th these people are mostly people who just came out of the uh, uh, concentration camp and the brigade was formed uh, with them as the members of the, or the fighters in the brigade. On her dance in nature, or this very act that is photographed there uh, before the partisans, Marta Paulin said the following, quote, standing by myself before a multitude of fighters and realizing that I could express with my gift of dancing and my feeble body, that which connected us, that I could master even the boundless natural space, I felt power in my feet whilst treading the hard earth. My arms could feel the breadth of the woods and climb over the trees. There was no imitation in my dancing, which would stem from the formalist moves. I rejected almost all that I had learned in my dance studio years. I was looking for genuine, fresh dance expressions, which, stems from, which stem from the vital human need to move. The photograph of Brina's performance shows, we can interpret it maybe that way, dance as a creative act in a revolutionary moment, in a moment of social transformation, which was bringing a new moment, which was also bringing a new society into existence. Performing a modern dance before the partisans, at least on the photo that shows pose as a revelation of truth, a haltung, was indeed poesis in the true sense of Plato's word, in the a sense in which poesis is not only an act of free will or praxis, but an experience of production into presence. That dance was for Brina an experience of revealing the truth is evident from her memories of the prison days in 1943 preceding her flight to join the partisans. Quote, besides the deeds imposed by my sense of duty, I was still thinking of my artistic career, of improving my skill and the act that I was rehearsing at the time. Dance was fulfilling me, it comforted and also protected me. Each time when they interrogated me, I defended myself by saying that I was a dancer. So, the next example. Zagreb, early May 1945. German and Ustasha troops are retreating from the city. Several filmmakers participate in the action of saving the filming equipment and material which the occupation forces intend to take with them. A part of the equipment has been transported from the former building of state production into private homes, but it is impossible to hide everything. Therefore, the cameramen have taken the cameras and come out into the streets, filming the retreat of Nazi convoy from Zagreb. In order to avoid suspicion, they camouflage some of the cameras behind the window panes or behave as if they were fleeing themselves. Sometimes they even ask the retreating soldiers to help them transport the equi equipment to a filming location. The whole action is coordinated by film director Branko Marjanovic, who is based in the city center and plans the locations. On 8th of May, the partisan forces enter the city, but the filming goes on. Mistrustful partisans occasionally stop civilians carrying cameras, but the cameramen tell them the predefined password. Florian knows everything. Even though Florian doesn't exist, and the cameramen have invented the password, a name behind the action helps to regulate the situation. The cameramen are left alone. In this way, a historical document is created that is known in present-day cinematography as the liberation of Zagreb. Everything has been filmed, documented. The object of cameraman's attention is permanently available, evidencing the fact of rapture, a revolution, an event of truth, a breakthrough from the situation, from the way things are. The film, same as the con password naming San Florian, resituates and names the event, deconstituting the community in decline and establishing another on the rise. Still, the story narrated above is indispensable for the truthfulness of the filmed material. The film is apparently neutral, void of all cinematographers' action. The main difference between the shots made before 8th of May 45 and the later ones is the fact that the documents about the retreat of troops from Zagreb are voyeur-like. You've seen these 
shots through the holes. Filmed from behind the window panes, clandestinely or with great caution. They have been made by cameramen with a mission. The shots of per partisans entering the city indicate uncertainty, but also show the enthusiasm of the cameramen. Their camera running with the momentum. With the momentum, the filming operation having become an action uh, and later on parade, a theater. Just to skip to that point. The shots were presented in the first issue of Filmske Novosti, a cinema journal, journal created by our filmmakers. Prior to 8th of May, they were employed in the production sector of Hrvatski Slikopis, an institute producing propaganda film journals for the puppet regime of Croatia. The day of the liberation of Zagreb also, also brought changes in the production staff. The idea behind the documentary operation became, in Nancy's, in Nancy's words, thought of a founding fiction or a foundation by fiction. In this way, our story has been transformed into a myth since that fiction is the operation as such. To say it more clearly, the operation is no fiction, but it's fiction the way our story goes, the notes on the making of the first post-war film material in Croatia, the history of Croatian film that includes it, or the narrative in the margins of film, is a whole operation. The story about the operation accompanying the documentary has transformed its own fiction into the foundation or into the inauguration of meaning itself. Paradoxically, the film doesn't document the story about the operation, but the very embeddedness of that story in the film, that is, before it has become a narrative, presents the living heart of the Logos. The myth of an operation being the operation is lived and living because it was created on the very spot of the event, at the site of its originating. It was created at the site where one cinematography was declining and another emerging, at the site of birth, of innovation, both social and aesthetic. However, what ideologically rehabilitates at that moment the cameraman is their professionalization, their attitude towards work, their claim that they are workers only, and the director's orders that they should act if, uh, as if they were mere reporters, professional workers, as he stated in his memoirs. Identification of the cameraman with the reporter frees him from being identified with the object of filming, as well as from the political connotations of ideological work, both previous and new. And this is a very interesting moment now in this whole social uh, uh, turmoil, how the work comes suddenly into proximity of the artistic production uh, in the new state. So let me go to the next example. It's called Zastava or the flag. So this is 1949, the same director who coordinated the operation of liberation of Zagreb, of shooting liberation of Zagreb. The flag was among the first feature films in the new state of Yugoslavia. It opens with a conversation between ballerinas uh, before their performance on Republic Day, a holiday celebrating the establishment of the state. The ballerinas talk of their stage fright and of performance as an act expressing the fullness of life. Ballerina Maria, the one you see here, the main protagonist of film, tells her colleagues at the theater how she, how she joined the partisan movement. Quote, you think that we should not live with all that happens around us. The true artist draws inspiration for his art from life. Only that way can we create durable and valuable pieces. You see, I was not on stage for three years. Does that mean that I didn't live at the time? On the contrary, end of quote. The film continues with a retrospection of her life as a ballerina, dancing on the national stage during the occupation, of being courted by a Nazi, and of her final loss of all illusions, resulting in her flight into the woods, as she then told to her partisan comrades, all that, was fa all that was false and worthless. I know that. And then she asks herself, but what should I dance here? Soon afterwards, 
We see her dancing a traditional folk dance with the partisans, and the film ends with another ballet choreography, that one, with elements of pantomime symbolizing resistance and heroism from which the new state flag is born. Unlike Brina the first, from the first example, in 1943, in 1949, this heroine doesn't know what to dance among the partisans. But four years after the revolution, opts for that which would come to incorporate the spirit of brotherhood and unity in the years after the war, folk dance and slat or rally ballet, the first link to the logic of popular identity and the second to the institution of the new order and the new state. For Maria, dance is no longer a question of experience of bringing a new expression into existence, but a representation of life, while performance is an act of will, an act of the living and willing being rather than a revolutionary one. It is a moment in which art is brought back from the woods to the apparatus, from production to practice, from movement to statehood. And the fourth example, oh, sorry. I will skip the beginning. Okay. The fourth example is somewhat obscure, yet extraordinarily interesting. It is a rather, rather unknown satirical film called The Mystery of I.B.'s Castle. I.B. is coming from Inform Bureau. Inform Bureau was a word for Cominform uh, or Communist, uh, Communist in, uh, Information Bureau, which was a kind of replacement for international, uh, for, for uh, Co Communist International at the time of uh, new states established after the Second World War. So, uh, Inform Bureau was Yugoslav name uh, for common form and it's a resolution of 1948 that accused the Communist Party of Yugoslavia of departing from Marxism-Leninism. Uh, this film is made after a one-act theater ballet in which the entire dancing elite of Zagreb performed. The same elite represented in the film by Maria, so the ones that were the, as if they were dancing in that uh, piece in the previous film. Uh, in, this, in its first part, the film uses the procedures of German expressionism and pantomime in order to depict a complot of Sov Inform Bureau, men gathered in a castle in order to devise a secret weapon against Yugoslavia after Tito said historic no to Stalin, Stalin in 1949 and thus separated from common form. The secret weapon coming out of the cauldron, uh, in which various poisons are concocted, is called Resolution. So her name is Resolution. It is a scantily dressed dancer who seduces the workers with some sort of free ballet dance movements, and you will see that scene now. So the resolution goes to the place of work. So she seduces them first at the construction site, then at the factory, and eventually on the train when they go home. What is particularly intriguing here is that dance appears as the opposite to work, which is how the third degree of transformation of the political context becomes visible, the one in which work, productivity, and economy play a crucial role. Work as a process directly linked to purely biological existence, as well as the material progress and welfare of the state, is diametrically opposed to poesis, as bringing into existence. Poesis is presented as a function of dominant and reactionary regime of representation, which we will find later on again in Rancière's uh, interpretation of poesis, or poetics, sorry. Agamben has argued that the difference between the two fundamental types of human activity, poesis and praxis, has been progressively obscured by bringing a third term into the relation, work. Work used to be the lowliest activity among the ancient Greeks, yet today it occupies the central value position as it has become the common denominator for all sorts of human activities. Quote, 
This ascent begins at the moment when Locke discovers in work the origin of property, continues when Adam Smith elevates it to the source of all wealth, and reaches its peak with Marx, who makes of it the expression of man's very humanity. At this point, all human doing is interpreted as praxis, as concrete productive activity in opposition to theory, understood as a synonym of thought and abstract meditation, and praxis is conceived in turn as, a, as starting from work, that is, from the production of material life that corresponds to life's biological cycle." End of quote. And when it come, comes to, I mean, one can comment also about the gender issues and all, all the other stuff in this movie, but okay, I will stop it here. <laughs> Let her a chance to swim, or maybe to survive. And when it comes to arts, uh, the today, today's tendency to reproduce artistic labor as an alternative to production of artworks with the claim to destabilize a fetish of object has actually turned into a fetishization of process where the so-called free, non-alienated artistic labor became usable good. As you know, in most of the performing arts houses, today artist is much more present by being there at residence, paid for living, or doing workshops, doing educational projects, running the institution, curating, etc., than by being pro by producing her work, so or artwork. And the presence and proliferation of artistic names through the institutions is much more related to number of atomized activities, which is much easier to monetize and recalculate through the application structures than uh, it was before, which also puts a, this free labor of the artist for a first time in a history in a situation of calculability, uh, which is not only related to exhibition value, as Benjamin calls it, but to the uh, monetization of the specific practices or work of the artist. And when it comes to, uh, oh, sorry, I already read it. Uh, however, at this point, we come to an important turnaround. This type of trans transforming artistic labor into a product can no longer be called work or process or work in progress. It is rather a social production or reproduction of conditions and modes of production, a kind of realism of production relations. Althusser would say that social production is only apparently the production of things. In reality, it is the production of a social relation, the reproduction of the relations of production. Because they represent processes, art institutions no longer separate spheres of circulation. They, are, they also produce conditions of production and distribution and references, and finally or initially, desire and consummation. Uh, how, how, how am I with the time? Uh, five minutes as everybody, yeah. Um, and this is the point where the final level of so-called aesthetic revolution manifests itself. The fact that the discourse on the modes of creation or poesis has nowadays become suppressed by a discourse in which the borderlines between praxis as an act of free will and artistic work have become blurred indicates that poetic clarity has been substituted through economic rationalization and transparency. This tendency has been articulated in the argument of Jacques Rancière on aesthetic revolution, uh, in which the poetic regime has been discarded in favor of the aesthetic one. Rancière interprets poetics normatively as re regime of representation, uh, quote, an ordered set of relations between what can be seen and what can be said, knowledge and action, activity and passivity. Rancière, end of quote, Rancière's affirmation of the aesthetic turn would require a separate treatment, which is out of the scope of this paper. Quoting Susan Buck Morse, reading Benjamin, uh, quote, the dialectical reversal, whereby aesthetic changes from a cognitive mode of being in touch with reality, to a way of blocking out reality, destroys the human organism's power to respond politically uh, even when self-preservation is at stake. Someone who is past experiencing is no longer capable of telling proven friend from mortal enemy." End of quote. According to Rancière, the aesthetic revolution has replaced the regime of representation. By abandoning its representative role, institutions have undertaken the role of regulators of the new regime, an aesthetic regime in which art is art to the extent that it is something else than art. Institution presenting art that becomes 
aestheticized or unaestheticized institution operating in the sphere of service economy and its contemporaneity lies in simultaneous production and consumption. Objectification of aesthetic operation and processual aspects of works of art have put artistic labor in the position of real abstraction. Institution is then turned into a place where credit invades art, as Jacques Camate foresaw in 1977 for Bobur. Institution is a place of promise and not production, and everything is possible just like in the world of capital. Quote of Kamate, when execution is replaced by credit, by a blank check, art finds itself reduced to derisory size and at the extreme disappears. It disappears by becoming, becoming almost the opposite idea, end of quote. Art institution can be an anticipation of politics, society, life, and finally, it, ca it can be an anticipation of art. In such institution, the artist is indebted and she knows her depth. However, her depth does no longer belong to the sphere of creativity, but needs to be verified in something that is its opposite idea. Artist labor has to be presented, at, end quote of Kamate again, art has to be produced from art and artists in a manner amenable to capital. To what matters is to touch the mass of human beings, otherwise there would be no realization of art, who still haven't internalized capital's lifestyle, who are still more or less bound to certain rhythms, practices, superstitions, etc. And who, even if they have taken up the vertigo of capital's rhythm of life, don't necessarily utilize its, its, its image, and therefore live a contradiction of jarring and are constantly exposed to future shock." End of quote. Institution must become a factory but not a factory of works of art or interruptions either. It has to be a factory of continuity, labor, production, or rather anti-production. Production incorpor incorporating dislocation, distribution, and consummation is nothing new in the world of capitalism. This symptom was defined as early as in Marx Grundrisse, whereas Deleuze and Gattari named it anti-production in anti-Oedipus, or interpreted by Steven Zepke, Anti-production works through all the mechanisms that prevent or recoup creative access, whether by refusing funding or support, or by rewards that integrate it into the flows of capital. In this sense, anti-production is not opposite of production, but rather supports and develops it. As a, re as a result, the greater visibility, prosperity and integration enjoyed by the arts today doesn't mean they have more creative freedom, freedom just the opposite. Contemporary artistic practice marks a particular low point in creativity and insurrectionary spirit, not least because resistance is now aggressively marketed as one of art's selling points. And maybe just to conclude here, I could continue, but I have to stop somewhere. Nonetheless, it is important to differentiate between the institution's capability to cope the most radical political critique and the most radical artistic excess. As we know from history, capitalism knows how to handle political excess, freedom of speech, transgression, individual subversions, and probably the best example of that are current Marina Abramovic reenactment performances, producing a popular consensus by reconciling radical action and its immediate consummation. Artistic creative excess, production of relations that have not been determined per se, still invokes differences and breaks the consensus especially if it comes from collective processes that presuppose focusing on the very principles of production and representation apparatus, thus becoming existential excess, a being there that immediately spins off on multiply effective trajectories that are entirely singular because they depend on the viewing act itself. We are used to think and participate in the discourse on the meaning of a particular sign, text or image, but there are always some things on their own. Just like in the famous Vole Soinka statement, a tiger doesn't proclaim his tigritude. He pounces. In other words, a tiger doesn't stand in the forest and say, I am a tiger. When you pass where the tiger has walked before, you see the skeleton of the tiger. You know that some tigritude has been emanated there. Thank you very much.